Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 13th of August 2021. These are the list of news articles that I have chosen today for discussion. These articles have been chosen keeping in mind that prelims is nearing. So, we are going to cover many of these articles from prelims perspective as well. So, if you look at these news articles, you can find that in today's discussion, we are going to discuss about missiles, especially about ballistic missiles. And then we are going to discuss a news article based on ancient history. And in that discussion, we will be seeing about Sangam age. And then we also have a news article in which we are going to discuss about an alternative to the river sand. So don't miss today's discussion. It is very important from the prelims perspective. Now let us move on to the first discussion for today which is going to be based on this news article. This discussion is based on this news article which mentions about a ballistic missile launched by Pakistan. See this missile is named as Ghaznavi. So today let us first understand about important types of missiles in brief. We will see in detail about the ballistic missiles and then we will see the Ghaznavi missile of Pakistan along with certain other ballistic missiles of Pakistan. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. So first let us talk about the important types of missiles. So you should first understand that missiles are rocket propelled weapons. So what is the meaning of rocket propelled here? See this rocket propulsion, it basically works on the principle of Newton's third law of motion. So what is this third law? It means to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And that means every forward acceleration or every charge in motion is a result of a reactive force which is acting in the opposing direction. So based on this underlying principle, what happens in a jet propelled plane or what happens in a rocket is that a mass of gas is emitted rearward at high speed. That is the gas is emitted at the back and then the forward motion of the plane is the reaction to this motion of gas. So the gas is this words and the forward motion is a reaction opposite to this. So that is why the motion of the plane is in this direction. So we can also say that rockets are self-propelled. It means that the fuel and oxygen which is required for the propulsion is within the engine itself. So that means the missiles are basically rocket propelled weapons. Now they are designed to deliver an explosive warhead with great accuracy at high speed. So regarding missiles, you have to remember that they are rocket propelled and then they carry an explosive warhead and they attack with great accuracy and also all of this happens at a high speed. So that is why missiles are strategically important for the defense of a country. So these missiles vary from small tactical weapons to much larger strategic weapons. Now these small tactical weapons have small ranges but these larger strategic weapons they have high ranges which could extend up to several thousand miles. And also we have various classification of missiles and these classifications are based on type, launch mode, range, propulsion, warhead and even based on the guidance system on that missile. But generally you should understand that all these missiles contain some form of guidance and control mechanism. So missiles are generally referred as guided missiles only. So in this representation you can see the general classification of missiles. You can see they have been classified based on the operation type, range, launch mode, propulsion system etc. And our focus today is going to be based on the operation type classification. So based on its operations, missiles are classified as cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. So briefly let us see about cruise missiles first. See these cruise missiles, they are unmanned self-propelled guided vehicle and they sustain flight through aerodynamic lift for most of its flight path. So the primary mission of a cruise missile is to place an ordnance or a special payload on a target. And these cruise missiles fly within the Earth's atmosphere and they use jet engine technology. Another interesting fact about a cruise missile is that they also vary greatly in their speed and ability to penetrate defenses. Also note that these cruise missiles can be categorized by size, range and also whether they are launched from land, air, surface, ship or even submarine. Now depending on the speed, we know that cruise missiles can be classified as subsonic cruise missile, supersonic cruise missile and even hypersonic cruise missile. For example, the BrahMos missile is a supersonic cruise missile and as you know, it is a joint venture between in India and Russia. So now let us come to the ballistic missiles. Now these ballistic missiles are the missiles that has a ballistic trajectory. So what is a ballistic trajectory? It is the motion of an object under the influence of 
gravity and this motion is determined completely by the acceleration of the gravity its launch speed and the launch angle etc in other terms we can say that its path is defined by the speed of its launch and the force of gravity that is pulling it down let us take an example here you all would have played cricket so while throwing that cricket ball you would have observed that it attains this kind of trajectory so the more the launch speed the farther the ball goes so this is how a ballistic missile also works it follows the ballistic trajectory which means the path of an unpowered object which moves only under the influence of gravity and even possibly based on atmospheric friction and additionally its surface provide no significant lift to alter the course of flight of that object now these ballistic missiles also have several categories and these categories are based on their range and maximum distance measured along the surface of earth that is uh, from the point of launch to the point of impact of the last element of their payload and these ballistic missiles also they can be launched from ships and also from the land based facilities so if you take the examples in india we have prithvi 1 prithvi 2 then dhanush they are all ballistic missiles and even the agni class of missiles which are the centerpiece of india's nuclear launch capability they are also ballistic missiles actually the five missiles under the agni class of missiles that is from agni 1 to agni 5 they belong to the family of medium to intercontinental range ballistic missiles so from this you would have understand that ballistic missiles could also be divided based on their range so generally there are four range classes first is the intercontinental ballistic missiles they generally have a range of over 5500 kilometers and then comes the intermediate range ballistic missiles irbm now they have range from 3000 to 5500 kilometers and then we have the medium range ballistic missile these have range from 1000 up to 3000 kilometers and finally comes the short range ballistic missiles which have a range up to 1000 kilometers so these are the base six that you need to know about ballistic missiles and missiles in common so now what about the ballistic missile which is launched by pakistan as we already saw in the beginning it has been named as ghaznavi and this is a nuclear capable surface to surface ballistic missile and this missile is capable of delivering multiple types of warheads which means it is capable of delivering nuclear warheads and also conventional warheads and it has a range up to 290 kilometers which is less than 300 so that is why this ghaznavi missile of pakistan is a short range ballistic missile so other than this you should also remember other ballistic missiles of uh, pakistan and many of these missiles were test fired in 2021 for example we have the shaheen class ballistic missiles in that shaheen 1a is a medium range ballistic missile of pakistan and then shaheen 3 is a nuclear capable surface to surface ballistic missile and then we also have the babur cruise missile then the fatah 1 ballistic missiles so in this representation which has been taken from center for strategic and international studies in this representation you can see the different ballistic missiles and cruise missiles of pakistan and how far these can go just take note of these missiles and their names in prelims a question can be asked based on the names of these missiles so with this information Let us wind up this discussion on uh, ballistic missiles. Today we saw about ballistic missiles, about missiles in general. We saw about the rocket propulsion, and we also saw about Pakistan's ballistic missile called as Ghaznavi. Now let us move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is going to be based on these two news articles. As you can see from the title of these news articles, they talk about CNG and PNG. The news is that. the chennai city is planning to expand its cng and png outlets and this is mainly due to the economic and environmental benefits offered by cng and png so in this discussion we are going to see about cng and png so it is going to be a factual discussion pay attention the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference see cng is the acronym of compressed natural gas and png is the acronym of piped natural gas So that means both are two different forms of natural gas, and that is why first we are going to see about natural gas. See, a natural gas is a mixture of gases like methane, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, which are rich in hydrocarbon. Now, these natural gas reserves are found deep inside the earth, and they are found near other solid and liquid hydrocarbon beds like coal and crude oil. So, how these gases exist deep under the earth? See here the high temperatures and pressures under the earth that is the earth surface plays a bigger role because these conditions 
convert the plants and animal remains that are buried under the earth into naturally occurring gas and also note that this natural gas is odorless colorless and it is lighter than air and it also produces very few emissions and it is also considered as the cleanest fossil fuel it is because it has clean burning qualities that is it has complete combustion so it produces mainly water vapor and carbon dioxide this means burning of natural gas for energy results in fewer emissions of carbon dioxide this is comparatively lower than burning of coal and petroleum products so this natural gas is environment friendly and it is a safer fuel and a cheaper fuel we will see why later in this discussion so keeping these facts in mind let us move on to the discussion of compressed natural gas that is cng see it is a type or a form of natural gas only so it is also a mixture of hydrocarbons and the cng approximately consists of about 80 to 90 percent methane in gaseous form so cng is not a liquid and therefore it is not a liquid fuel also and this natural gas is compressed at very high pressure and that is why it is called as compressed natural gas so why there is a need to compress this gas see the sole reason behind this is to store an increased amount of this gas in a given space this in turn helps us in using it for a longer period of time so some of its characteristics are it is inflammable and it is lighter than air and it is also colorless and odorless so where it is used it is mainly used for power generation and it is also used as fuel in the place of gasoline petrol etc but here you should note that cng can be used for combustion only in the cng based vehicles so this was about cng now let us look into piped natural gas that is png so it is similar to cng only except for the pressure this png is compressed at a lower pressure when compared to the cng and apart from this another difference between them is that the form in which they are delivered that is cng comes out of natural gas bottles on the other hand png is supplied through pipelines for the purpose of household needs that is unlike cng which is stored at a single place png is not stored at one place rather it is continuously supplied through the pipeline from the source to the destination or the target so this helps to provide uninterrupted supply of heat for cooking requirements here one fact to be noted is that the pressure of png depends on the type of burner which the customer is using but however both the cng and png are refined natural gas with methane being their primary constituent so keeping these basic facts about cng and png in mind let us look into their advantages see both are advantages to human health and environment's health so first if we take cng it is lead free and sulfur free so it is lead free means it is not harmful for the health of human beings why because lead is harmful to the health of human beings as it causes central nervous system damage and it also impairs neurological development in children now it is also sulfur free as we already saw so it is a advantage because sulfur has several undesirable properties when combined with the internal combustion engine see the sulfur is acidic in nature so this results in the corrosion of constituent metal parts and apart from this it also reduces the catalytic activity of the vehicle so it reduces the effectiveness of exhaust systems apart from this when burnt in air sulfur converts into sulfur dioxide so when this is released into the atmosphere it can form an acidic solution and it dissolves in the rain to form acid rain and as we know acid rain causes widespread damage to the environment it affects lakes forests etc etc so like this sulfur has many environmental concerns and since this cng is sulfur free and lead free it is called as the green fuel and as we just saw it also reduces the harmful emissions then apart from this cng is safer because they are stored in cylinders which are certified that means there is so negligible chance of leakage but since they are lighter than air even if there is a leakage the gas just rises up and it disperses in the atmosphere and it mixes with the air easily and evenly but if you take petrol or lpg petrol forms puddle if it leaks so both of these lpg and petrol are not safe 
So this is why CNG is a safest fuel. Apart from this, CNG is also non-toxic and non-carcinogenic. That means it doesn't cause cancer. Then it also has certain economic benefits. See, CNG is economical and it is also one of the preferred alternative fuel sources for vehicles today. Why? Because it is cheaper when compared to petrol or diesel. Why is it cheaper? Because Earth's natural gas reserves are found in abundance when compared with the fuels like petrol and diesel, which are already depleting. Also, methane, which forms the main component of CNG, is more sustainable since it can be created from biological waste and sludge also. Then the logistics requirement for CNG is comparatively lesser than petrol or diesel. And we saw that it is cheaper. So it is more affordable because there is no cess attached to CNG like the petrol or diesel. And therefore, the price of gas is likely to be more stable than oil. So these are some of the benefits of CNG. Now what about PNG? See, it is also considered to be a cleaner and better cooking fuel. An additional advantage with PNG is that it doesn't need cylinders to store this fuel. So it saves a lot of space and also PNG is offered on pay after use basis with metering. That means you have to only pay after using this fuel, not beforehand. Then apart from this, it also ensures safe, easy and secure handling because this PNG is transported through the pipeline. So it is constantly fed into the system. So there are no hassles of handling, refilling and changing of cylinders. So apart from providing safety, comfort, it also provides uninterrupted supply to the consumers. So that is all about PNG. In this discussion, we had a detailed discussion about natural gas, compressed natural gas and piped natural gas. We saw about their benefits also. Now let us move to the next discussion. Now let us take up this news article. It reports about the emergence of unlicensed M-Sand manufacturing units in the districts of Tamil Nadu. See, it is alleged that the presence of such unlicensed manufacturing units, they actually lead to substandard material of M-Sand reaching the markets. So because of this, the licensed manufacturers are asking for strict regulatory measures by the government. So from exam perspective, now we are going to see about this M-Sand. See, we all are well acquainted with the term sand. So what does it mean? In simple terms, sand is defined as a mixture of small grains of rock and granular materials. Now, these small grains of rock and granular materials, they result from the disintegration of rocks. And one of the main advantages of sand is that it has multi-purposes. That is, it is a multi-purpose resource. In fact, sand is the world's second most consumed natural resource after water. So where it is used, sands are used as fertilizer fillers. They are also used in paintings, they are used in cleaning oil spills, they are used in growing root crops, etc. And one of the most popular uses of sand is in the field of construction. So earlier, the main source of sand for constructional purposes was the river sand. But with the fast growing construction industry, the demand for sand increased tremendously. So many started illegally mining the sand. And this led to many environmental issues such as it destroyed habitats. See, the excess extraction of sand from lakes, riverbeds, deltas and shores destroyed habitats it changed the course of rivers, it eroded the banks of the rivers and it even swallowed up many villages in India and even worldwide. If you look at this representation which we have taken from the website Monga Bay, you can see that how sand mining has affected the course of this river. So such continued usage of river sand led to the depletion of suitable river sand and this resulted in the scarcity of sand on one hand and on the other hand the prices of river sand was rising. So this unprecedented hike in the cost of this raw material led to gradual shift towards an alternative to this natural sand or the river sand and then came the M sand. See here the letter M stands for manufactured. So this M sand is a manufactured sand and it is an artificial sand. It is produced from crushing hard stones, rocks and granites into small sand sized angular shaped particles and these are used as a substitute of river sand for the concrete construction. Here you should remember that the actual required property of sand is obtained in this M sand also and its manufacturing process is also synonymous with the natural process that is undergone by the river sand. So based on this, let us see some important advantages associated with M sand. See these M sand particles are angular and they have a rougher surface texture. So this enables better bonding and it provides improved strength. And also compared to the natural sand, this M sand has got a higher fineness. So this in turn gives good workability for concrete and masonry. Then it also has denser particle packing and it is also free from impurities like clay, dust and silt. 
So these two properties help the M sand in maintaining a better structure. And apart from this, it is readily available and it is also eco-friendly. And it is also a sustainable resource for construction purposes. But beyond all these advantages, it also has certain disadvantages, such as this manufactured sand can be of a coarser and angular texture. So such textures require more water and cement to achieve the expected workability. So therefore, this can actually result in increased costs of construction. So like this, there are certain disadvantages to this M sand also. So that is all about this M sand. Today we saw what is sand, what is M sand, its benefits and also disadvantage. Now let us move to the next discussion. Okay, now let us take up this editorial article. It has been authored by two experts. In this editorial, authors have summarized the effects of strictest, generalized and continuous closure of schools and colleges during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have already seen about this topic in our daily newspaper analysis. That is, we have seen how lockdowns and school closures have affected education in our country. And authors also deal with the same issue in this long-winded editorial. But still, let us quickly understand the crux of this editorial and then we will see about the index which is discussed by the authors and some of the way forwards suggested by the authors the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference see the authors have referred to the continuous closure of educational institutions as the largest educational emergency in the world so why are they calling this as an educational emergency so we know that india experienced a continuous and longer period of lockdowns in the education sector. So for a longer period of time, children were being taught and they are still being taught through the online classes only. And this has severely affected the children's belonging to the vulnerable sections of our populations like the Dalits, tribals, etc. etc. Why? Because they do not have internet connectivity. Why they do not have internet connectivity? Because they do not even have access to electricity itself. Then how can they get internet connectivity and how can they attend online classes? So this is being cited as one of the main issues in the education sector in this pandemic era. And apart from this, many studies have also indicated that teachers are unprepared for remote teaching. So what is this remote teaching? It is nothing but the classes conducted outside of a physical classroom, such as using the online mode. So when this remote teaching is happening, children are expected to submit homework and assessments through WhatsApp or even through text and mails. So we can understand the difficulties that would be faced by the children. So to tackle this issue, several state governments introduced good initiatives to deliver education at the doorstep of every household. For example, if you take Kerala, it provided basic access to remote learning to millions of students through its educational TV channel. This channel is named as Kite Victors and through this channel classes were broadcasted for all subjects in each grade. But still, according to the authors, these digital classes are not seen as an alternative to the regular classes. They just acted as a bridge to the widening academic gap due to the pandemic. And despite efforts from the states, the online mode of education has proved quite challenging only. Then another observation that could be made in the education sector is regarding hybrid schooling models. See, hybrid schooling models are nothing but a combination of in-person and remote teaching. That is, combination of classroom teaching and remote teaching. And the observation that could be made is that even when hybrid schooling models were introduced in many countries to prioritize children with special needs, India still failed in this regard. Now, apart from this, interruptions in child health services and interruptions in early nutrition have affected the growth and development of young children. Why? Because as schools were closed, many children who depended on midday meals for their food and nutrition, now they are unable to get the food and they are at the verge of malnutrition. So if you ask the government why still the schools are closed, the main answer which is given by the government is that closed schools are a commitment to children's safety. That is, they say if the children attend regular schools, they might contract the disease. But what about the other scenarios in which the children are pushed where they can contract this disease? For example, there is higher risk of disease transmission by working children. And as we already said, school closures are also causing increase in malnutrition. So both these aspects are being ignored by the government. And this is not only prevalent in some states, but it is prevalent at the national level. So to explain these issues and their severity and to support their argument, authors have used the findings of an index. This index is called as the Global Stringency Index. See here the term stringency could mean the strict and precise regulation and conditions. 
So let us see about this index in brief. Take note of this index. It is important from the prelims perspective. And you can also mention this index to support your claims in a main answer. See this global stringency index. It was created by the Oxford Coronavirus Government Response Tracker. In short, Ox CGRT. So this is a Oxford product. This index records the strictness of government policies that primarily restrict people's behavior. So how it is calculated? It is calculated by a composite measure of nine response metrics. These are the nine metrics and it includes school closures, workplace closures, cancellation of public events, restrictions on public gathering, etc. So the score of the index is calculated by the mean score of these nine metrics and each metric takes a value between 0 to 100. So a higher score indicates a stricter response. That is a score of 100 implies strictest response. So that means if a country has a score nearer to 100, we can say that from the health perspective, the country is doing everything to contain the spread of the virus. But if you look at the economic perspective and the education perspective, the score of 100 would imply that the countries are performing worse in these arenas. So what is the score of India? See, since this is a tracker, the scores of this index are dynamic. So the last score which is available for India is July 19, 2021. And as you can see, the score is above 80. But if you compare India with other countries, India still has high levels of workplace closures, school closures and travel bans. This representation gives you a comparison between India, United States and United Kingdom. And as you can see, the lockdowns started in March 2020. So India at that time also, it is having a score of 100. That means it opted for the stringent measures that were available during that time. We had the national lockdown. Everything was stopped. And the lockdowns were relaxed in May only. So after May, we can see that the score literally comes down to 80. But even after a year and a half, we are still in this 80 range only comparing to the other two countries of United States and United Kingdom. Because in this map, we can see their stringent measures were not that much strict. And if you see this representation, which is given in the map, you can see that India is still in this dark red category. And if you move this tracker from Jan 2020 to August 2021, India's position does not change much. It is only in the range of 70 to 100 category. That is, it is represented in dark red only. But if you see other countries such as USA, it is already in the orange category. That is, between 40 to 50. So, this shows the level of strictest measures taken by the Indian government to curb the spread of coronavirus. But as we already said, it has affected the other spheres of our life. So, regarding education, authors have suggested some remedies. For example, authors have suggested to focus on every child individually and they have also suggested to prepare a safe school opening for example already some countries have opened the schools and students are asked to maintain the social distancing criteria and they are asked to wear masks and then another suggestion is prioritizing vaccination for the teachers and then also developing tools to help the teachers for making a quick diagnosis of students learning gaps then another important suggestion by the authors is setting up an education emergency room and this is to be set up in every district to coordinate, implement and monitor the local plans regarding education. So according to their district needs, they can plan either online classes or offline classes. And apart from this, authors have suggested to deploy technologies that will identify and respond to the needs of the children. So these are some of the points that you can take note from this editorial discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the situation of education sector in our country and how children are getting affected due to the school closures. And we also saw about the global stringency index and what is the score of India and where India stands. Now let us move to the next discussion. This discussion is based on this news article which is important from ancient history perspective. The news article mentions that a small portion of a brick structure has been unearthed at an archaeological site in Tamil Nadu. It has been unearthed in the Purpanai Kotai, which is situated in the Pudukote district of Tamil Nadu. See, the excavation at this site was started after some pot sherds were found in this place. And after these pot sherds were found, it was speculated that this area might have a Sangam age fort. And that is why Archaeological Survey of India sanctioned excavation at this place. So in today's discussion, let us have a detailed discussion about this Sangam age. See, Sangam age refers to the period of history of ancient Tamil Nadu and Kerala. 
and it refers to the period from 5th century BCE to 3rd century CE and some sources even mentions that it is the period roughly between 3rd century BCE and 3rd century CE so basically it is in south india in the area lying to the south of river krishna and river tungabhadra now this age is named after the sangam academies or the intellectual congregation that were held during that period see these sangam academies are the assemblies of poets that were held in the city of madurai and these assemblies of poets in tamil is known as sangams and that is why this period is known as sangam age so at this period obviously the sangam literature also flourished according to the tamil legend there were three sangams held in the ancient south india and these were popularly called as muchangam this term can be split as moonra sangam here moonra in tamil means three and sangam means sangam as we already saw so this term is related to sangam age so in this the first sangam is believed to have been held at madurai and according to the legend it was attended by gods and legendary sages but no literary work of this sangam is available now the second sangam was held at kapadapuram and from this sangam only tulkapiyam survives tulkapiyam is a sangam literature so remember this term Now the third sangam it was also held at Madurai but a few of Tamil literary works from this sangam have survived and they are valuable sources to reconstruct the history of sangam period so you should remember that the literary products of sangam age is a window into the ancient Tamil society and that is why this is very important from the preliminary point of view now this sangam literature chiefly consists of tolkapiyam ettu togai and patthu paattu see actually the sangam literature was compiled in the 10th century into two categories and that was also based on the chronological order and these two categories were padinen mel kanakku and padinen keel kanakku now in this padinen mel kanakku it means 18 greater text series and it comprised of this ettu togai and patthu paattu and the rest of the sangam literature were under the padinen keel kanakku and this term padinen keel kanakku means the 18 lesser text series Now, apart from these, Tolkapiyam is also a part of the Sangam literature, and it was the earliest. Then you should also remember about two epics. They also belong to the post-Sangam period, and these two epics are Silapadi Garam and Mani Megali. So, all these literatures help us to know the society, economy, and culture of the ancient Tamils. So, remember Tolkapiyam, Ettu Togai, Patthu Paattu, Padinen Kiri Kanakku. padinen mel kanak silapadi garam mani megalai so these are texts in the sangam literature so now what about the kingdoms that thrived during the sangam period see there were three important kingdoms these were the chera kingdom chola kingdom and the pandya kingdoms and these existed in the tamil country during the sangam age few days before we have seen about the chola kingdom in detail now in addition to these three kingdoms there are also local chieftains and the most famous among the local chieftains were the seven patrons who are popularly known in tamil as kadayelu vallalgal so remember chera chola pandyas and then the kadayelu vallalgal Now let us see the important social features of Sangam age. These are also important from the Prince perspective. Now in the Sangam age, Tamil people had a common language and culture, but they lived in five different natural landscapes. These natural landscapes or geographical regions were known as Tinais, and totally five Tinais are mentioned in the Sangam literature. These are the Kurunji, Mullai, Marudam, Neidal, and Palai. Now you should remember that each of these Tinai was geographically distinct from the other. So here the term kurunji refers to the hilly tracks and the term mullai refers to the pastoral geography and then the term marudam refers to agricultural region and the term neidal refers to the coastal area and then the term palai refers to the desert region in addition to this each of these regions reflected their own social characteristics as a reflection of the geographical and ecological needs and it is also important for us to know about the position of women during sangam age see actually women had respect and they made intellectual pursuits during this age there were even famous women poets in this age they are the avayar nachallayar and then kakai padiniar these women poets flourished and contributed to tamil literature apart from this women also chose their partners in this age but the life of widows was miserable and there is also a mention about the practice of sati which was prevalent in the highest strata of society during this sangam age so these are some of the social features of the sangam age in this discussion we saw about the sangam age about the sangam literatures their important kingdoms and also some social features now let us move to the next discussion 
Now let us take up this news article. It is regarding Al Mohed Al Hindi. So what is this Al Mohed Al Hindi? Say so it is the first bilateral naval exercise between India and Saudi Arabia, and that is why the news article mentions it as a maiden exercise between India and Saudi Arabia. And see, this naval exercise will be conducted in various phases, and recently the sea phase of this exercise has begun. And this is the gist of this news article. So you have to remember, Al Mohed Al Hindi is a naval exercise between India and Saudi Arabia. So in this context, it is important from the prelims as well as from the international relations perspective to know about other important naval exercises of India. See, generally we have bilateral as well as multilateral exercises. So let us see some of them today. When we say bilateral, it means between two countries, and multilateral means the exercise between more than two countries. So first, let us take Varuna. See. Varuna is a naval exercise between India and France, and this exercise forms an integral part of France-India strategic relationship. Now, this exercise is held annually, and it is held either in the Indian Ocean or even in the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the 19th edition of this exercise was concluded in April 2021, and it was called Varuna 2021. So now the next exercise that we should know is the Milan exercise. So this is a multilateral naval exercise and it is a biennial exercise. So it happens every two years. Now this exercise is hosted by the Indian Navy and it is hosted under the aegis of Andaman and Nicobar Command. And it is held at Andaman and Nicobar Islands only. So, as I already said, this is a multilateral naval exercise. So, the navies from many countries participate in this exercise. For example, in 2018, 17 foreign navies attended this Milan naval exercise. But why we are taking the example of 2018? It is because the 2020 edition of Milan exercise got postponed due to the pandemic. And if this exercise would have happened, it would have been the largest edition of Milan exercise. It was said that almost 30 foreign navies would have attended this edition. But sadly, it got postponed. The next important exercise is the Indra exercise, and this is a bilateral exercise. It is between India and Russia. So it is a joint biennial military exercise. This exercise started in 2003, and the aim of this exercise is to boost cooperation and interoperability between the Russian and Indian navies. Now, the latest edition of this exercise was called as Indra Navy. It was held in the Baltic Sea. It happened last month only, that is in uh, July 2021. And finally, another important exercise that we should know from exam perspective is the Malabar exercise. See, this is also a multilateral exercise. Exactly, we can say. It is a trilateral naval exercise. It is because this exercise involves the United States, Japan, and India as the permanent partners of this exercise. And this exercise was not always trilateral. Initially, it began as a bilateral exercise in the year 1992, and at that time, only India and United States were the permanent partners in this exercise. But it became trilateral when Japan joined this exercise in the year 2015. But now, it has turned into a quadrilateral exercise. It is because in its latest edition, another important country participated. in this malabar exercise and the participation of this country made this naval exercise as a quad naval exercise yes you are guessing it correct the another country is australian navy as you know india usa japan and australia are the members of quad group so in the latest exercise which was held in 2020 australian navy also participated in the malabar exercise and that is why i said it is becoming a quad naval exercise so let us wait and see what happens in the next edition of this exercise so in this discussion we saw about varun exercise indra exercise milan and also about the important malabar exercise now let us move to the next discussion okay aspirants with this news article discussion we have ended this first segment now we are moving to the next segment of practice questions discussion session now let us take up this first question it asks which of the following is not a characteristic feature of compressed natural gas so the question is about cng first statement it is called a green fuel because of its lead sulfur free character this statement is correct we saw this characteristic feature of cng during the discussion itself so this statement is actually correct it is called as green fuel statement 2 it is quite expensive when compared to petrol or diesel the statement is incorrect because during discussion we saw that it is quite cheaper compared to petrol or diesel and it is also affordable than petrol or diesel because of this so statement b is incorrect now statement c says it is non toxic and non carcinogenic This statement is also correct, and because of this, it is one of the safest fuels. Now, if you look at option D, it mentions both options A and B. 
but we saw that option A is correct. So that is why option D is also an incorrect option. So the correct answer is option B only. So before marking the correct answer, pay attention to the question. Now this next question is a pair based question. On one side reports or indices is given and on the other side the agencies which releases these reports is given. Now look at this first pair. It is ease of doing business. It has been paired with World Bank. This is a correct pair. This report is released by World Bank only. Now look at this second pair. Human Development Report ILO that is International Labour Organization. See this report is not released by ILO. So this is an incorrect pair. Rather it is released by the United Nations Development Program. So the moment you know this pair is incorrect, you can arrive at the correct answer because if you look at the given options, two has been mentioned in three of the options and the question actually asks for the correctly matched pairs only. So you eliminate two from the options and you are left with only one option which is option A, one only. So this means third pair is also incorrect. Today we saw about global stringency index and we said that it is an Oxford product. So that is why this pair of global stringency index and UNDP is an incorrect pair. Now let us take up the next question. Now this is a direct question. It asks Al Mohed Al Hindi that was in the news recently is a naval exercise of India with which of the following countries? Oman, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Qatar. And as per the discussion we know that this is a naval exercise between India and Saudi Arabia and this is the maiden naval exercise between both the countries. So the correct answer is option B Saudi Arabia. Now this next question is based on ancient India. Question asks Muchangam a term that you come across in ancient times refers to. Option A a temple architecture. Option B the guilds in the Vedic. Option C the tax laws in Vijayanagar empire. Option D the Sangam periods. So based on our discussion itself, we can easily say that the correct answer is the Sangam periods. I told that Muchangam is the short of Mundra Sangam and Mundra means three. So there are three Sangams according to the Tamil legend. And we saw that the first Sangam is believed to have been held at Madurai and the second Sangam was held at Kapadapuram and the third Sangam was again held at Madurai. So remember these facts, these are important from prelims perspective. Now let us take up another prelims question. This question is based on ballistic missiles. The question asks which of the following missiles of India are ballistic missiles? Nirbhai, Agni Prime, Dhanush, Prithvi 2, Brahmos. See among these Agni and Brahmos are quite common and if you look at the given options you can see that 2 is present in all the options and we also know that Agni Prime which was recently test fired by DRDO is a ballistic missile and if you look at Brahmos it is quite famous missile of India and you should definitely know that it is a cruise missile so you have to eliminate 5 from the given options that means A and B are eliminated now we are left with 2 options C and D and now you have 50 percentage probability of attending this question correctly. So from the given options you can say that 2, 3 and 4 are definitely ballistic missiles. Now you have to discuss and consider only option 1 which is Nirbhai. See this Nirbhai is also a cruise missile. It is actually a long range subsonic cruise missile and it is capable of deep penetration into adversary territory and it can strike high value targets with precision. So that is why one is incorrect. So the correct answer to this question is option C, 2, 3 and 4 only. That is Agni Prime, Dhanush and Prithvi 2 are ballistic missiles of India. Now let us take up this last question for the day. It is a two statement question. First statement is manufactured sand or M sand are produced by crushing rocks, quarry stones or larger aggregate pieces into sand sized particles. This statement is correct. We saw this during discussion. Now the second statement is plastering manufactured sand is used for wall plastering and brickwork purpose. See this statement is also correct. Here this plastering manufactured sand is in short called as P-sand. Actually we saw that the unprecedented hike in the cost of river sand led to the gradual shift towards certain alternatives and one of the alternative was the manufactured sand and this manufactured sand can be subdivided into two. One is the M sand and the P sand. And in this, the P sand, that is the plastering manufactured sand, is a very fine grade of sand and it is used for wall plastering and brickwork purpose. But note that proper selection of P sand provides plastering strength to the construction structure. So that means this statement is also correct. And here the question asks for the correct statements. So the correct answer is option C, both one and two. So viewers and aspirants, now we have come to the end of today's Hindi news analysis and practice questions discussion session. Today we do not have any mains question. So don't worry, practice these six prelims practice questions 
and you can assess how much you have understood from today's discussion. So if you like this video, don't forget to like, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil services preparation. Thank you. Thank you.